Hey, as we wrap up today, uh, we want to look at the fourth thing that just sin does. As we're looking at the Cain and Abel story, um, this little kind of mini focus about, about understanding uh, how to defeat sin. Uh, if I don't know how sin works, I'm probably not going to defeat it um, because it's going to keep surprising me. It's going to keep blindsiding me. Um, so some of us are right there. We just I can't figure this thing out. So four things we've been looking at. The first one, sin lies in wait. That's God speaks to Cain in verse 7 and says, sin's uh, crouching at the door. And the word um, revats means it's lying. It's stretched out. It's resting until it sees you close, until it sees when you're vulnerable. We talked about some ways that we can be vulnerable. And then it pounces. Uh, it lies in wait. It, it lures us off course. It just gets a little of a, it's going a little bit, a little bit. You could be led astray by saying, yeah, I'm not going to go to church today. I'm not going to read my Bible today. I'm not going to pray today. You're just a little crack, and all of a sudden it starts taking us in the wrong direction. It lures us off course. That's how it works. Um, it um, listens not. It, it doesn't listen to correction. The correction of the Spirit, the God's Spirit wants to correct me. That's the first thing. The Spirit, if you've said yes to Jesus, is in you, and it, the Spirit wants to correct you. Reading God's Word, when I'm reading it regularly, guess what the Scriptures want to do? Uh, teach, rebuke, correct, encourage, right? It wants to correct me. Uh, look at 1 Timothy 4.3. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. It wants to correct me. Um Someone else might want to correct me, but when sin is luring us away, when sin is kind of deceiving us, these desires start to bend away from, from my desire, a contrary desire from being close to Jesus. You know what it does? It causes me not, want, not to want to listen to correction, just to ignore it. I guarantee you, um, if you or you know someone that is... Um, just being defeated by life, by brokenness in relationships, turning away from uh, from Jesus, I guarantee you um, they're not wanting to listen. Shema, the Hebrew word for listen. They're not wanting to listen to correction. Remember the Shema. Hear, listen, hear, O Israel. The Lord your God is one. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children, your lineage. Impress them on your children. Um, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, you get up. Why, why do I talk about it so much? So I can impress them on my children. You know, one of the things that are at stake uh, whenever we are lured away um, whenever uh, we don't listen, we we can teach our children to not listen either. Uh, we teach our children that God's not a priority. We teach our and not we don't like we don't sit down and say now kids um, lesson number one God's not a priority. No, no, it's not. It's not by our words. It's by our deeds. It's not by what we say. It's by what we do. And whenever our behavior says God's not a priority, you know how it does it? It just does it by making something else a priority. Uh, going to the lake, uh, watching football, uh, doing a barbecue. Um, you fill it with anything you want. A distraction is a distraction. And when God's no longer been put in first place, it means, first of all, maybe he took second place, and then third, and then fourth. And pretty soon, our lineage, our kids, say, oh, God's not that big of a priority. I guess I can do whatever I want. And then what happens? Mm, the consequences start happening. Because sin always has consequences. It might be something minor if the sin was minor, but it's a consequence. It's sadness. It's remorse. It's regret. It's distraction. Or it can be major whenever the sin is more major. It can be a broken relationship, a failed marriage, um, a child that won't speak to you, a spouse that wants to divorce you. It can have massive consequences. 
And those consequences get passed, what the Bible says is, from one generation to the next, to the next. When we see the story of Cain and Abel, and we look at it, the whole thing um, in context, uh, we see the fail. Um, we see two brothers, two offerings, two choices. And then we see two seeds. We see the seed of Cain, which is the seed of the serpent. And at the end of the seed of the serpent, seven generations from Adam, we see a man by the name of Lemek. Notice what Lemek does. In verse um, 23 and 24, Lemek said to his wives, you know, Lemek, you know, goes further away. And pretty soon Lemek doesn't want one wife. He wants two. And we see the battle of the sexes in, in full rage, um, in full com combat. He's got two wives, not one. I'm not going to have one wife. I'm going to have two wives. Presumption and pride kicks in. We have two wives. He says to his two wives, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for, for striking me. What? What has happened? We have we have a murder that's that's out of jealousy and 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 bitterness of Cain and Abel, and then we've got a guy that says, you know, just just wound, just hit me, strike me, and I'm going to kill you, and then he's going to boast about it, and then his boasting goes into overdrive, and he says, if Cain is avenged seven times, God's blessing and protection on Cain, then Lenek will be avenged seventy-seven times. He's doing what sin always does. It always takes over God's role. It always presumes when it shouldn't. It always wants to be God, power up, take advantage of others. Sin has gone from um, something terrible to something egregious. Its effects seven generations down the line. And the story is Lemek is out of control. What does sin do? It leads our lineage, our children astray. This could stir up all kinds of stuff for us, right? If we have, kid, we have kids and children that are just astray, they're just struggling, um, sin is having its effect. And it does. And um, it's not that you are responsible for all those generations. They make their own choices all along the way. But the hope is, is when we live in a submitted posture to God, when we defeat sin in our life, it can be easier to defeat in the life of one down the road, the next generation. Uh, our, our mission as a church, our vision is that we are a loving community of growing disciples, mentoring the next generation to live the mission of Jesus through the power of the gospel. When our priorities of Jesus stay in place, you know what we're doing? We're hitting the mark. We're keeping the goal in front of us. We're reaching the objective God calls us to. We're partnering with him. And when our kids see it, and are blessed by it, they'll want to be a part of it. Let's pray for our kids. Lord Jesus, um, if, if a person has children, you know you love them so much. God, we want to pass on the right thing, not the wrong thing. We want to pass on tov, not raw, good, not evil. Lord, we want to help them understand how sin works so they can see that it lies in wait, that it lures us off course, that it listens not to correction. Lord, help us to nurture our children in such a way that it will not lead them astray. Lord, we put our kids in your hands and we ask that you draw them to yourself. Protect them from the evil one. God, uh, co help correct them in such a way, Lord, that even if we made mistakes, they wouldn't make the same mistakes. Lord, help us to live in such a humble posture that they see us clinging tightly to you. Bring our children to you, Jesus. Draw them by your spirit. Protect them, Lord God. I look forward to seeing you this weekend as we continue to talk about um, the major nemesis in our lives. Um, the major nemesis is the evil one and the evil he wants to do that can lurk inside of us um, because it's this sin, this desire that just goes astray. I look forward to seeing you uh, this weekend. God bless.